Mm -hmm. All right. Hey, everyone. Anthony Fantano here, Internet's busiest music nerd. Hope you're doing well. And right now we are up for... Ugh, let me restart that intro. Fuck, I fucked it up. Hey, everyone. Anthony <laughs> Fantano here, Internet's busiest music nerd. I hope you're doing well. We're about to embark on an exclusive interview and conversation with the one, the only, Detroit's own... Uh, the, the lyrical miracle. I don't say that as a joke. I don't, I don't say that as a joke at all. <laughs> the lyrical miracle himself. Uh, Miss, Mr. Mr. Danny Brown. How you doing, man? What's up, man? How you doing? I'm, I'm doing good. I mean, I, I've known that, um, you know, for a while now you've been doing a lot of streaming and a lot of online stuff. And, and I've known that like the opportunity to like get together and have a conversation has, has, Probably always been there, um, but but yeah, you know you my boy. But, Hit me up whenever. I, but 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 I've been kind of waiting. You know, I've been kind of waiting because I'm I've been sort of waiting for the right moment to have a conversation because I I, I want to hit at a point where. Uh, you know, I, I think, I think 2021 kind of makes sense because, uh, it, it gives me an opportunity to ask about a few things that, uh, we, we, as the fans, I guess are kind of like really curious about, um, maybe off the bat, let me just ask like 40 is, is 40 mm -hmm. a thing is 40 happening at, at, at one point you popped into my live stream and gave me 40 subs. In a very in, in a very cryptic kind of in a very cryptic like fuck with me kind of way, like you like you gave me specifically forty. You popped in out of nowhere and you said, "Here's forty subs," mm -hmm. and that 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 felt to me like kind of a like you know the bat signal, but like the Danny Brown signal or something. Mm -hmm. You know what, what what were you trying to tell me in that moment? Is like forty on the way? Is forty a thing? I mean, it's done. Uh huh. It's done. Okay. I mean, it's just it's getting mixed, right? Actually, um, Ali. You know, for do he did a Trashy exhibition too from TD. He um mixing it right now. He was just waiting on the right time, and but it's not called forty. It's called quaranta. Oh, okay. You know what I'm saying? So you know, you know, it's a you know. <laughs> I don't want to give away too much. Why? But people, you y'all figure it out. You know how I go. Yeah, I mean, you know, sort of like I guess keeping with the um. I guess the theme or the vibe or the energy of, you know, your breakout mixtape 30, is this project going to be a reflection of, I guess, like your current day mind state or what has kind of brought you to this point? Is it, you know, more about uh, your history or is it more about, you know, what's happening in the now for you? It's a, it's a, um, cause when you, when, when I made 30, it was pretty much about me going through my twenties right. to finally get to 30 and, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna make it as a rapper. Or don't know, should I give up? Should I, you know? Mm. So now with 40 is, I became that rapper, mm. you know, the last 10 years of that. And, you know, we get the pros and cons and, you know, my fuck ups, my self account. It's a lot of self accountability on this album. I will say that, mm. you know, it's very, I will say it's, it's an emotional ass album because it's something that, you know, my life dream was to become a rapper, you know? And then it's like, you know, motherfucker tell you Santa Claus don't exist no more. You know what I'm saying? Right. So kind of like to, you know, it's a heartbreak album. It's just saying. <laughs> you know, you really get in the shit and you really see what it is. And you're like, oh, fuck, it's not really it's not real, you know. Mm. So, yeah. Well, with that, I guess, like accomplishment out of the way for you, um, whether it be on this record or just in life in general, like what are those questions for you? At this point, like, what are you feeling like right now? You're wondering, what am I going to accomplish from here? What am I going to survive to see? You know, what other goals do you have in front of you right now that you're trying to push yourself toward, maybe in the same way that you had on 30? I think my problem, like around the 30 time and all that, like once I kind of got on, it was, you know, I was on, but I never got a chance to appreciate it because I always was like terrified that it was going to end any day. Mm. So I always had myself in this depression and this fucking stressed out state. And cause I always just felt like, you know, this shit might end any day mm. instead of just enjoying a moment. You know what I'm saying? And now after 10 years, I think I'm just now starting to enjoy the moment kind of because I realized not too many artists like me make it, you know, I ain't, I ain't faking the SoundCloud play. I ain't doing nothing like, you know, say all oh, my is organic. So 
for me to get where I'm at is a blessing in itself in this music industry. You know what I'm saying? Like and to do all the things that I did. So I'm blessed. Like I hate when a person come to me, be like Danny Brown underrated, but Danny Brown, no, we lucky I made it this far the way this industry is. You know what I'm saying? So I'm blessed. I'm happy, man. So now I just think right now I'm in phase two of this Danny Brown thing. You know, I mean, with me doing the Bruiser record stuff, I'm getting more into production, you know, producing and stuff. You know me doing comedy now, so mm -hmm. you know just phase Danny Brown phase two right now. Well, uh, I'm a total different person than what I was ten years ago. But that's you know that's anybody. That's just growth, no. You that's know? true. And uh, I I do want to get into all of that. I guess like you know to to reflect for a second though, um, you know I I could kind of appreciate though this feeling that it was hard to I guess kind of make sense of the moment that all of us were in through. Uh, the 20, the early and like mid 2010s, uh, you know, not just like in terms of what you were trying to accomplish personally, but just um, the music industry in general was so volatile because streaming wasn't, you know, completely like fleshed out yet in terms of its footing. And there was so much change going on in hip hop specifically with so many artists like yourself kind of you know, uh, siphoning off success with this burgeoning like online scene that was going on and, you know, kind of the shift away mm -hmm. from things being more geographic, you know, in terms of like uh, what sounds and styles and, uh, you know, deliveries were coming from what places. Yeah. And it was real gatekeepy back mm -hmm. then. Like if you didn't have a certain look, if you didn't have a, you know, before like social media picked our stars, you know right. what I'm saying? Like I was like the beginning of that, like me walking in the record labels, fucking looking dirty with a missing tooth. They didn't give a fuck what my music sound like. You know what I'm saying? They already judged me before. Oh, shit, I cut my camera off. <laughs> bye, bye. That was cool. But yeah, I forgot what I was saying. No, you were just talking about like social media kind of being that upending of like where we... Oh, yeah, yeah. I was like the beginning of yeah. that because I don't think without it, it wouldn't have really happened for me the way it did. Because I've, 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 I did the label thing and been around and, you know, I did that for almost five years, you know, and, and nothing really was coming out of, out of it besides the, uh, um, them lowering my self-esteem with every record meeting, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, it, it did really like upend things, like not only just with you, but like looking back at, um, you know, like the way Odd Future popped off back during that point in time as well. But now with like you and artists like that being 10 years on and seeing the success you have, do you feel like in a way, you know, do, do you think the Internet and social media are still bringing us like, you know, exciting changes, new artists and new faces, like groundbreaking sounds and stuff that's game changing? Or do you feel like in a way we've kind of ended up in the same rut all over again, but it's just online? <laughs> Yeah, we ended up in the same rut again and all over. Because now we got, because you got to think it's all about the likes and the views. So you got fucking 21-year-old white kids telling us who hot now. You get what I'm saying? And hip-hop never been like that. You know what I'm saying? It always been dictated by what the streets like. You get what I'm saying? And now it's like, you know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's frat kids. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's the majority rule now, yeah. I think, with music now. Like, it's almost like, if this person's popular and he, everybody like his shit, it's like, you you gotta like it too. Or you just look like a lame for not liking it. You know what I'm saying? Where, you know, it's, it's, it's harder to find music now, I think too, when it's just so much bullshit pushed in your face. Every tweet you see in, you get 10 videos up under it with some nigga saying, check my shit out. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? So it's kind of hard to find new, I think it's just, it's, it's like needles in a haystack now. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Where before we can just, you know, if it's like word of mouth kind of shit, like you know who to trust, like your homie, you tell you like, oh, check this shit out. You check it out and it's fire. Now you can't even trust your homeboys. <laughs> Everybody caught up in the hype, you know? No, I mean, it's definitely like a different kind of hype wave right now. And, um, you know, even if uh, even if it does feel like there's more choice, uh, it, it just becomes, I think, every year, like more and more unnavigatable either because there's mm -hmm. so much out there and there's so much spam and there's so much in your face at every minute, or it's sort of like the algorithm kind of closing in on you and sort of limiting the amount of things that you're seeing week to week. And, uh, you know, excellent exactly. point to what you're saying with like, um, <clears throat> you know, appealing to white audiences. I mean, you know, being a white person myself, obviously, uh, 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 maybe, maybe I'm qualified and unqualified to speak on this in certain ways, but, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of funny to think about, this debate going on in terms of like 
white influence in hip hop. And while to a degree, it's true that like, you know, uh, Eminem for as popular as he is, like, you know, has, has very little influence in terms of like dictating what young black artists are making and listening to like that much is true, but like simultaneously that angle. And I guess that argument kind of ignores the power and the influence of the white dollar, because exactly. if you're not paying attention to, you know, what white kids are listening to and what they're hyping up, like you're kind of ignoring, I, I guess, the dollar. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're kind of ignoring I mean, I'm not about what's to driving s- the culture in a way. <laughs> I'm not about to sit here and act like my fan base. Yeah. Like, damn, you're completely white either. You and, know and, what to, I'm and to the so degree that I'm responsible I'm saying, for that, I'm, not- <laughs> I'm sorry. And to the degree that I'm responsible <laughs> I'm for that, not- I apologize. No, you're not responsible <laughs> at all. You know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, what urban... <laughs> I don't I don't see too many like urban like hip hop blogs putting people on the new shit. Mm-hmm. You feel what I'm saying? It ain't no urban version of a Fantano right now. Like it ain't you know we just got blogs. I mean we got podcasts, you know what I'm saying? They but ain't nobody, you know, and even the other ones, they still review like, you know, major label rap stuff. You know what I'm saying? They don't put you on no underground shit or they not just gonna take a chance like, oh, this, I heard this, this is fire, you know? Like how you would do. You would just hear some shit like, oh, this shit I'll call it, throw it up. You know what I'm sure. saying? Which which I'm still doing, by the way. Which I'm still <laughs> doing that. I'm still I'm still tr- doing my best to do that. You know, I mean, I I, 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 I got- Think about it, you you reviewed the loopers with help when he put out help, you know how long ago that was like, that was crazy for you to do that back then. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, you know, like at, at, at the end of the day, like the option is there if I want to, to just like review whatever mainstream record like is out or sort of like crosses my path. But, um, if, if I'm not reviewing some indie stuff or some stuff that just I'm into just because I'm into it, like I, I'd go fucking insane. Mm-hmm, exactly. Yeah. Same here. Same here with making music. I couldn't make nothing that I, I don't feel comfortable releasing. You know, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night if I put out a hit song that I thought something. Mm. You get what I'm saying? I don't think I would be able to live with myself. Like if everybody, my my biggest song or something made a lot of money for myself was something that I didn't really fuck with like that, you know? Mm. It would hurt me. I mean, it's like, I, I appreciate that you say that, but like, you know, simultaneously, uh, it, it's just sort of funny to me to think about how you know, someone like you is in, is, is, you know, having those feelings and feeling that way. And I don't know, it's, I I feel like we're at a point where creatively in the mainstream, it's, it's almost like when you came onto the scene in the early 2010s, you were such an, you were like such an anomaly. And now it sort of seems like weird has been normalized to the point where if you're not like (laughs) trying to be as out there and as eccentric as possible, like, and is if, that my if, fault? Did I like? Do that? <laughs> may, maybe, maybe we can put that on you. Maybe we can put that on you. But, but like, like you know, I, I feel like you were ahead of the curve in that way, and now you've arrived. It wasn't even. And and it wasn't even. Uh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> go on, go on. <laughs> I think I helped out all the ugly rappers. Like it wasn't even <laughs> no ugly rappers really before me. Everybody had muscles, you know, good skin, and yeah. cute and shit. Now everybody ugly than a motherfucker, man. Like, you know what I'm it's hard to find a few <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, like, look, I, I, th- I think it goes to, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I, ch- I chose, I, I don't know why I, I, you know, I, I put up the picture to announce the interview that we did. And, um, you know, I, I chose the picture that I did, even though it's not the newest picture. Like, you know, I've seen you streaming lately. I'd, I know that was my fault. I was supposed to send you a picture. No, no, it's, 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 it's not a big deal. You know, I, I, I've seen that picture before. I think that's a great picture of you. So I, I use the picture and with, that's my church, that's picture. your church. picture. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, like, uh, you know, when when I see that picture, it's a great picture. Or it it also what I like about that picture, it, it reminds me of how far you've come. And I just remember like one of the first responses that I saw to, and I always see this fucking response is like, I miss Danny when he had fucking teeth missing, blah blah blah. blah, blah. Oh, and it's like, aren't you happy about the fact that this guy like bettered himself through his music and like grew and exactly. advanced and so on and so forth? Does the guy have to be like? on the fucking edge for the rest of entire for the rest of his entire life to make you happy. You feel what I'm saying? This teeth cost thirty thousand dollars, man. So we need to be <laughs> you should respect that. Like he was able to he was able to spend thirty thousand dollars. Some people some people himself. spend like that or twice that for the grill. So like what the fuck? 
Um, yeah, I had real bad teeth. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and you got and you got them fixed and you got them fixed. It took two years. It took two years of them getting them fixed. Like y'all didn't know, but my bottom, my tops was missing, but I would just have a grill over the top. Right. So didn't nobody know for like a year I was walking around with like a missing top. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Got it. But yeah, you know, it's, 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 it sort of seems like a d- weirdness has been, you know, co-opted it's been mainstreamed and you know I, I just think you were ahead of the curve on that and and uh and and it's sort of like interesting to see people kind of like you know again reacting almost negatively to you bettering yourself and getting to a more stable place because it's like people just want this facade or this presentation of i guess like you know uh i think but i, I think when they say that sometimes they be talking about the music mm. too you know, because the music has changed. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to sit there and say it hasn't, you know. Mm-hmm. So maybe, they, you know, but I mean, artists, we know this. Everybody grows. Yeah. This is just normal shit. So, I mean, I can make some shit like Triple X in a heartbeat, but would that challenge me? Would that make me a better artist when it's time for the next album? You know, mm-hmm. it's almost like I, everybody always be like, um, rap like the NBA. I look at rapping like boxing. You know what I'm saying? And every album is a fight. You want to take 10 fights in a year, end up with CTE. And like, I'm trying to preserve my body so I can keep fighting and live a life after this shit. You feel what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Oh, no. I, I think that's a great point. A couple of questions off of that. Like, what do you feel about this, which I think is becoming, you know, less and less of a of a worry, but of this, like, maybe dying taboo that, like, aging and rap is a bad thing or rapping as someone who's older is a bad thing or like that's cringe or that's not a good look or whatever. Like is, is, is that something I mean, that concerns you? No, I think it is supposed to, I think it is supposed to be what it's supposed mm-hmm. to be. I don't, me as a 40 year old man, I shouldn't be sitting around listening to what no fucking 16 year old got to be talking about. You get what I'm saying? I'm a mom. Wait, you, wait, you, you, you don't think young boy is better? But young boy older. I got He's it. He's more that's mature true. content. You know what I'm saying? He he talking grown. He nigga got babies. Right. He talking about kids. He talking about any man that's in the streets could fucking, you know what I'm saying? Get something out of him. You know what I'm saying? But I'm saying a mother I, I'm forty so it's motherfuckers my age too that been listening to hip hop just as long as mm-hmm. me. They don't wanna listen to that shit either. We all you know what I'm saying? That don't mean they gonna sit on Spotify all goddamn day and listen to the mm-hmm. shit. But at the end of the day, at a we we all still have our own fan bases and just you know, take care of them. I'm I'm not worried about what the rage crowd doing. I'm not worried about what none of that shit is doing. You get what I'm saying? I'm out in my business in my own little corner of hip hop. Mm. And if it expands to a city, hey, that is what it is. But to the end, don't come on my block trying to sell no shit. There's going to be problems. Mm-hmm. You feel me? Well, well you know, with, with that point, like, what do you think about... Um, you know, Kanye is like an example, obviously an artist who you have a lot of respect for and you enjoy his stuff. But like and and I enjoy a lot of the stuff that he comes out with when when he's doing this and he, and he attempts this. I think he has sort of a knack for, you know, keeping current. But when like someone like Kanye is featuring Cardi on a record and essentially like ho- hopping on a Cardi style beat and trying to like maybe co-op that sound in a way like you know, does that feel in concept like something that's weird to you? Do you feel like, uh, you know, as, as long as it's done well, is it done, as long as it's done well, it's done well? Or she, should he be worried more about just like forming his own thing? I mean, Kanye is an amazing producer. Yeah. So I feel like he, he knows a producer, but it's still kind of cringe. Mm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but he's just he's an amazing producer. So I would love to hear what Cardi would do. You know what I'm mm. saying? With a full Kanye album. Sure. Okay, you know what I'm saying? I would love to hear that mm. shit, you know, but far as like you know i don't know i'd rather him make some shit for niggas his age sure you feel me <laughs> sure sure you, you gotta impress the kids man that's the problem right now all these old niggas trying to impress the kids and that's what's happening right now you can't let them be the end all say all to what's going on for the future sure and and you know i think like the internet provides that option and i, I just think more people need to kind of take advantage of it because obviously everybody's got you know, a fucking smartphone in their pocket and everybody likes music, Mm -hmm. like make music that's geared toward the demographic of people that, you know, you want to connect with. I I think that, you know, uh, with the internet, I I talk to a lot of people my age and they tell me that they're pretty much like tuned out of stuff right now. And they have no idea who the fuck any of these people are who I'm talking about week to week. And it's like, I I feel like you should, because I mean, some of these kids are doing cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But definitely. That's what I say, man. I don't, that's one thing I do love because I still, to me, hip hop 
is all about being was true to yourself and being yourself. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't respect them if they was trying to rap like Conway. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm sure. saying? I wouldn't respect that shit because that's not them. They not even from that. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Not saying like no younger kids can, you know, do their homework and do some boom bap shit. You know what I'm saying? I just know that's not the popular you looked at the weird kid in high school probably right sure. now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I just know it. <laughs> and I know, and I was in high school, I would have been with the cool kids, so I wouldn't have been mm. doing that shit either. So um, it is what it is. To, to go back quickly to 30, because you were talking about, you know, being able to do that sort of thing now or, or sort of like seeing your creativity there as something you've advanced past in a way, like, you know, with that album or that, you know, tape being 10 years old at this point, like, uh, you know, have you had time to, I guess, like reflect on it more, or have more feelings about the material on that beyond just having felt like I'm in a different place now? Like when you listen to that project, you know, do you have any, I guess, like feelings about the music in, uh, you know, in, in general, or just like um, the place you were in personally? This is what people got to realize, man. I recorded triple i mean i writ i wrote all the i wrote the album out i had the album written out and i recorded that album at a studio where i couldn't really afford the studio time so the engineer believed in me so he would stay over after and when the studio supposed to be closed he open it back up and we'll go in and work from like 2 a.m to 6 in the morning so two four hour sessions eight hours i made triple x you know what i'm saying maybe i ain't Gonna go that far. It's probably about four sessions. It's about four sessions. Cause I remember Skywalker came to one and my girl took me to a few. So yeah, so it's I did that in four sessions. You know what I'm saying? I had it already in the tub. Mm. You know what I'm saying? When I signed the Foos Go, I signed for five thousand dollars. <laughs> that was my advance. Holy shit. I spent it. <laughs> Holy fuck. I spent it. I spent it in one weekend at South by Southwest. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, that's 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 how South by was back then. Like, and even even if you were a popular artist going to South by, you were losing money going to South by. No, I had flew all my homies out. You know, I did. You know, I was being cool. You know what I'm saying? But look where we at from that. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I always tell people I'm blessed, man. Don't you know what I'm saying? Right. You know, uh, speaking personally, like given some of the, I guess, uh, the topics that you were. Um, engaging with on that record and in thinking about just like how much more deeply since then drug culture and rap culture have kind of intertwined to the point where we're, you know, seeing the losses of uh, people like Juice World or, you know, Lil Peep, for example, like, you know, uh, does the material on 30 sound any differently to you in, in, in that regard, yeah. like thinking about the way things have kind of moved yeah. since then? Cause I remember first thinking about it in some sense, like, um, Cause you know, like it was like gangster rap, mm. or then it was like, um, or you rapped about selling drugs, or you know what I'm saying? And I was like, yeah, I sold drugs, but I ain't really all against it. I was like, I was just really kind of like talking about myself, but still trying to add a level of shock value to right. it, in some sense. Cause, in, cause sometimes it's exaggerated a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Right. But for the most part, I was still talking about my life. You know what I'm right. saying? So I wasn't trying to make anything cool, you know. But I remember just like being on tour and stuff. And, kids would come up to me and like, yo, let's get fucked up. And, uh, and you know, that's when I started being like this, you know, that's thing, this is what I signed up for. You know what I'm saying? I'm not really trying to, you know, be a, a bad influence on someone in that sense, mm. you know? So I, I, you know, I mean, I still, I mean, it's, it's a double edged sword, man. That's the only way I can put it, but yeah, man, it, it does, it does, you know, fuck with me a little bit. Mm. No, I mean, in a, in a way it was almost like a, a dark kind of prophecy. And and as somebody who's been listening to your music for a long time, like I could say personally, I kind of got it. I mean, look, I, I, I didn't know to what extent you were living that life by the book. I figured it couldn't have been lyric for lyric or you would have been dead. Um, you know, but, but, it, but it seemed pretty clear on a lot of the tracks that like, okay, he's like multiplying the extremity of this, to communicate, hey, this is like really fucked up and dark. Like, don't do this. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, because I do. I will say I do get a lot of people that um, hit me up, like messages and stuff, and just be like, how much that helped them, you know, get clean mm-hmm. or get over stuff by seeing someone going through the same type of stuff and had this music. So I do get as as much negativity as it brought. I did get a lot of positive out of it where people like Triple X saved my life. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? I, you know, stuff like that. So. 
you know, it's like I said, it's a double edged sword, man. Yeah. No, and I mean, it, it seems like, you know, you're one of the few artists that I could think of who, you know, you dropped this record and you, and you came through with this, you know, this image and this persona and, um, you know, obviously like you didn't know the fucking future. Like there, there could have been no possible way that you would have seen or understood or known like the way that it was all going to plan out. But it, it seemed like after kind of building up unintentionally this mystique that, you know, as you kind of say, people were kind of taking this, these implications off it and saying, Hey, let's go get fucked up. Let's do this. Let, let's do that. And sort of having this understanding of you based off of what they were reading in the music, you then had to be on that, like almost like buck that expectation and try to change that perception of yourself with people. And, um, you know, I mean, like what, what, what exactly, I guess, was kind of that, that realization point for you that you needed to kind of like, not clean yourself up per se, but sort of like remind people, Hey, like, you know, this, this is sort of like a cautionary tale here. I'm trying to like, you know, relay some information to you and kind of, you know, give you my experiences, not encourage you to do what I'm doing. I don't know. Cause, um, I don't think nothing to be <laughs> like nothing really like I had like a real bad situation with lean and I was like fucked up and you know I got off that shit but it's like um you know like even I don't know man, everybody has their vices you know mm -hmm. sometimes so I'm not gonna see here like because a lot of people the craziest shit is with the you know what I'm saying album and everybody was like oh Danny Brown's so clean and all this stuff that was the most fucked up time of my life <laughs> If I want to be honest with y'all, I was fucked up then. Like now, me moving to Texas now, I'm getting a little more healthier now and shit. But yeah, man. So, you you know, people have their own personal problems and shit like that. You know, that's all. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Like I say, you say something that happened that made me, I mean, I mean, the Mac Miller thing definitely hit me really hard because he, you know, me and Mac Miller had our little things, you know, back in the day. But, you know, through you know mutual friends schoolboy q you know we got cool and stuff and then um like right before i remember one day um i was at the, i was in la and i was leaving and my flight got canceled i mean my flight got canceled i was like fuck guess i'm stuck in la i tweeted it and then he just hit me up instantly like yo i'm in the studio pull up pull up i was like fuck it hell yeah I'm, so i got me a hotel room i get to the hotel room you know put my shit down get an uber go straight to the studio I get to the studio and he just got me outside knocking on the door for like a half an hour or some shit. So I was like, fuck that shit. So I just got in the Uber and left back, went to the hotel room. So I was pissed. I was like, fuck Mac Miller at that time. I wasn't fucking with him. You know what I'm saying? Like, man, cause made me pull up to the studio, answer the door, but then he ended up calling me that night. Like my bad, I was making the beat. It was too loud. I didn't hear the door. You know, he probably was doing whatever. But then um, like right, like the, literally like um, he had hit me up. And he was just like the week of when he passed. And he was like, man, you know, do we got any problems? We cool. You know, we squashed everything. It's cool. He's like, man, you should come out to LA, make music. And the day I was supposed to go out there is the day he died. Mm -hmm. And the only reason that I didn't go out there is because I was in the car when they announced it. So it was just like, fuck, you know? So I think, yeah, that was a, definitely a cautionary tale for me. Cause every time I feel like stuff is going a little too far, I think about him. Yeah. When when you talk about like being in a bad way when you're making, you know what I'm saying, that's kind of interesting because I uh, because, you know, th that album does come across in in such a way where you're almost like portraying yourself kind of moving past a lot of those demons, though. Yeah, because I didn't want people to keep being like he beating the dead horse. Mm. Like, don't nobody want to keep don't nobody want to keep hearing a motherfucker be like, I'm, I'm on drugs. I need help. I need help. Every album, like, come on, damn, nigga, go get some help. You ain't got to keep telling me this shit. You get what I'm saying? So I wanted, you know, I moved past that. At the end of the day, it was showing that I'm trying to move past mm -hmm. that, you know? Every now and then, uh, I slip up. I, I'm, I'm human just like everybody else. I try my best. You know what I'm saying? Would you say that, though, putting yourself in that mindset, like, writing-wise, maybe helped you encourage, you know, yourself to, you know, manifest those changes in your behavior in a way though yeah i guess so in some sense you know because mm -hmm. just being around q-tip in in general mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying you know he super you know religious and stuff good good, in, good influence yeah he was fast and he would he had to while he stopped letting me drink in the studio like i'm tired of you stumbling around this motherfucker everywhere man you so then he banned me from drinking in the studio <laughs> So then that wasn't fun. <laughs> yeah. And and it is Q tip. You do have to kind of listen to him. 
Yeah, you definitely gotta listen to them. You know what I'm saying? So, but I learned a lot. That was one of the one of the most best experiences I ever had in my life was being able to work with him. Mm. Um, all right. Uh, you know, let let me ask you about some of the creative projects that you've been diving into lately that uh, have been taking up your time. Like, you know, what what's what's kind of pushing you to go further into comedy now and like doing stand up stuff? Because I've I've caught you kind of streaming a little bit of. Uh, you know those performances uh, uh, on on your Twitch recently. It wasn't. It wasn't necessarily. I mean, I guess it was just a, a natural thing because mm-hmm. it was always something that I always wanted to do. I remember when mother, you know, when you say what you want to be when you grow up in in the classroom and shit. I used to say I want to be a rapper, and motherfuckers would laugh at me. So I got to the point I would just say I wanted to be a comedian because that was actually the second thing that I wanted to be. But you know, rapping was just way more cooler. Mm-hmm. So I just figured that one out, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But what it all it was, just when I hang around other comedians and they just tell me how funny I am. And they like, if you really want to, you know, people that I really respect and look up to, and they like, man, you really got it. Like you can do it. Like you figure the shit out, you you got it. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, you know, after, after you know, they give you so much um, confidence, you know? So now, nah, I mean, it's just all about me getting on stage, you know? I mean, I've been writing, I write, cause you know me, I'm a fucking writing nerd. Mm-hmm. I didn't took a motherfucking Steve Martin master class. You feel what I'm saying? <laughs> with the with the with the with the YouTube videos and shit. <laughs> no, the real master class. Okay. Well, I, I I mean YouTube videos. I'm I'm, I'm oh, saying I'm versus- saying YouTube videos like a boomer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, with the videos. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like I'm class. I'm getting so old everything is YouTube to me now. I don't read all the comedy books. So now it, at wow. this point in my life, now at this point is just get my ass on stage, but you know I got other shit I got to do, you know, but you know, that's why I'm in Austin though. Mm. So it'll, it'll be happening. You know, creatively considering your crossover here, like what have you found to be, I guess like the overlap or the differentials in your mind when it comes to either rap writing or joke writing? You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I kind of the same. Yeah. In yeah. Some sense. That's that, I mean, that's, yeah, I, 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 I figured if somebody was going to see similarities between the two, it would be you. And, and, and if that's the case, because like what, yeah, write, what, are, what are those similarities? I, I was writing raps. Hold up, my dog's going crazy. Yeah. Take care. Take care of it. <laughs> looking at chat. Looking at chat. Danny Brown masterclass. We do need a Danny Brown masterclass. I guess she wanted her camera time. Yo, chat is asking for a Danny Brown masterclass. Just to let you know. Nas got one. Yep. Take the Nas class. Yeah, That's there's the that. Nas class. Woo! Yes! Dog appearance. Yes, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, um, you know, creatively, what do you see as kind of those crossovers or, or I guess those commonalities between rap writing and joke writing? No, because I was I used to write my raps like jokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like before I was able to um, really just write a punchline on the spot, I used to like just sit around and Anytime a line would come into my head, I would write it down. I would write it down, you know. So when I would sit down to write a rap, I would have these fucking uh, just a whole bunch of one-liners. So now I'm just writing around the one-liners and putting everything together. And pretty much that's how stand-up comedy is in some sense. But with rap, you kind of know what works. With comedy, you don't know what works until you get your ass up there. You feel what I'm saying? I can record a song and listen to it right there. I can get the feedback quick. Mm. With comedy, you know. You um you gotta really get your ass on stage to find it. I told myself I'm gonna go in VR chat and start doing um uh, some stand up sets. That might be an easy way mm-hmm. I can do it. <laughs> Just sit at my desk. No, it's true. I mean, there is something about like music where it works really well, you know, in like a recorded setting or in sort of like, you know, a pre recorded composed kind of format. Whereas like comedy, I mean, there's great comedy records out there, but like, I, I, I feel, I feel great comedy for sure. But I feel like some of the, obviously some of the magic is lost when it's not live. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because even when you're a comedian, if you've told the same joke, like a hundred times, different room, different audience, however, it's kind of playing out in your own head. Like the same joke would play out differently over and over and over. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, like, but with rap, I feel like um, you can hide behind the music. Mm. You feel what I'm saying? I feel like being on stage is you and a mic, and right, you know, it's time to shine, motherfuckers, on you or not. You get what I'm saying? So I feel like with music, you can kind of dance around. You can play. Half these motherfuckers don't even be rapping no more anyway. They got the backing track. They just up there doing dance moves and shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They don't even be rapping the song no more. <laughs> so. It is what it is. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> no, but I mean, uh, the, the, I think, you know, to your point, what you're saying about like one liners in general is definitely like a huge, I guess, commonality that rap and, uh, and, and comedy serve, especially like, a. Uh, I think of someone like Bruiser Wolf, for example, you know, to sort of like mm-hmm. jump into the Bruiser Brigade conversation, maybe yeah, for a second. He write he write the same way. He write the same yeah, way. Yeah, like every, pretty like much, pretty much every a... fucking song that he puts out is just packed with hilarious one-liners <laughs> that you just do not fucking see coming. Shouts out Bruiser Wolf, man. That's my boy, man. I love him, man. It's a blessing, man, for you to know him, man. I swear, when I first heard him rap, my mind was like. Like I just couldn't even, you know, you knew I was gonna love some shit. Like no, ab- absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. <laughs> like off oh, rip. When I first heard him, I'm like, please, hey, please be my friend. <laughs> I can't even remember the. I can't remember how the line starts, but like that one punchline that he does, where he's like. I love this more than white people love dogs. Like I'm, I'm trying to remember what the fuck that line is. But <laughs> he say, uh, I, "I treat my dog better than white people do." This. <laughs> <laughs> like, but man, every fucking song is just packed with just insane shit. And yeah, man, you know, just, just like just like with com- just like with great comedy, it's sort of like you know the, the jokes he makes causes you to think about some things in a certain way or or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, so so I mean, I, I think you know those commonalities. But are I definitely think that's there. just. That's just me and you know, Bruiser Brigade. It's 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 comedy and all it like Zaloopers is a funny motherfucker. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Like it's comedy and all our shit in some sense. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know. That's just maybe what I take a liking to. I like funny motherfuckers, man. That's just is what it is. Man. Yeah. I mean, with with Bruiser Brigade in general, I mean, you guys have had a bit of a push lately, dropping a lot of projects on Bandcamp and everything. Um, you know, what's like the ambition in regards to you know, building up that brand or that collective right now, because obviously like, you know, Bruiser Brigade has been a thing for a while, but like, you Mm -hmm. know, noticeably though, with all these recent releases, it seems like there's been more of a push to kind of like pull it together, get some concrete records and compilations out and and really make it a thing. Because this is my last album under contract, so I'm going to be a free agent. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) now... You know, mm-hmm. you can see where I'm going with mm-hmm. that. Like, so we'll see. You know what I'm saying? What happens? Got it. <laughs> so, 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 so you'll be the Kendrick Lamar of the Bruiser label. I mean, I'm already that <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, yeah. obviously, but like you know, you're you're gonna you're planning or you're hoping to just sort of like yeah, make I'm, make I'm it a label thing in and business. of itself. Yeah, definitely yeah. more into the business. Okay, side. and then where you know, yeah, definitely. Okay. That's that's the goal. That's the goal. Okay. I I don't see myself. I don't see it being smart for me to sign to a record label after this deal. Oh, wow. You know at, 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 as far as I've gone, you know unless I'm signing to signing to my own shit, you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? And then they can partner with the squad and that will be that. You feel what I'm saying? Is is are, is there anybody else that I guess we can look forward to right now in terms of like any potential bruiser prospects Are you guys looking to build the roster even oh, further? Yeah, um, I got this new kid. His name Bleachy Warhol. Ex- excellent so, yeah, name, got, we, by the way. Excellent, <laughs> excellent name. So we working. So I'm working on Bleach. I just, you know, I'm just busy right now. I haven't really had the time. Mm-hmm. But you know, JUS new shit's coming out soon. That's the next one we dropping called GoFundMe or Corvette. Okay. <laughs> I'm really a GoFundMe up for his Corvette. <laughs> so if you want to donate to JUS GoFundMe Corvette, campaign, setting sights high. Setting I'm sights be- high <laughs> off the bat. <laughs> The comedy, right. man, you gotta understand. No, I, I get it. The comedy we bring, man. No, I, I, so, yeah. I get it. Is if if anybody wants to submit their stuff, is is there is there is there a bruiser submission page, or do you need to come down to I don't know the, the bruiser up. boxing ring and get beat up? They go bleachy right now. Bleachy just up. <laughs> Shouts out bleachy we're hauling them up again. Okay. Chat. So yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a real one, man. If you come across me, man, and I hear the shit, I like it, man, and you want to fuck with the squad and you vibe with us like that, it is what it is, man. I just want to make good music, man. I ain't trying to um, you know, I ain't trying to puff daddy nobody. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> good. Good. I ain't trying to puff daddy nobody. I'm just trying to I'm just trying to be a fan and let everybody know why this shit is fire. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> let me ask you about a few like crossovers recently that I and and a lot of fans have been kind of curious about Um, uh, loved the surprise of hearing you on that recent uh, Dorian Electra my agenda you know Mm -hmm. remix and everything how did that connection happen because like obviously I love Dorian's music I think they're insane but like you know how how did that reach out come about 
I just love her shit too. Yeah. And I mean, I, I never would have um, thought that um, hey, hit me up. You know what I'm saying? You don't be you don't be thinking people be fans of each other like that. Right. You know what I'm saying? And it just happened like that. Like that's the one thing I learned too, though, man. If you like somebody, man, and you really fuck with their music, just tell them. Mm. Cause you never know what'll come out about that. You know what I'm saying? I guess we're in this clout chasing generation where don't nobody want to network. It's not a networker no more. It's clout chasing. You feel what I'm saying? But that's all that was. She just hit me up like, yo, I fuck with your shit. I'm like, I fuck with your shit. And it's like, let's do some shit. Let's do some shit. Hell yeah. Boom. There it go. Is 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 you know the current hyper pop wave inspiring you? I a love lot? that yeah. shit. I love that shit. Like I fucked with the with the gags, you know what I'm yeah. saying? So <laughs> <laughs> I was supposed to been do. I was supposed to do some shit with them. Just I was doing Danny's house at the time <coughs> in New York, and I was supposed to, and I just didn't get time. And I really feel so fucking bad. I mean, I missed out on so many features, a lot of shit, mm. just being Danny. Mm. I, I, <laughs> I and a couple people were wondering, like, um, considering that, like, you know, early into the 2010s, you know, you were one of the first rappers that was kind of popping off on the internet that was like really supportive of. Uh, some of these rappers coming out of the UK and, you know, what was going on in the mm -hmm. UK at the time, you know, with rap music and with hip hop. Mm -hmm. and, and now it seems like the footprint and the influence that's having back in the States is bigger than ever. Like not only in terms of like underground stuff, because the slow tie record's so good and the, uh, you know, little Sims record is so good. But like, you know, just looking at the huge impact that uh, UK drill has had, you know, especially on like the I East think Coast. That's really more so what it yeah. is, is just the drill stuff, because I mean, it's not the type of uk rap i listen to. no you no no, no for sure I, I i guess I, but not saying that <clears throat> i love the drill stuff too you know what i'm saying but like gets and sims they had like two of the fucking best albums of this year to me sure. you know what i'm saying still like the uk still every year they still damn near they releasing the top 10 for me you know what i'm saying it's still coming from there even i love the fucking sleep for my shit you know what mm -hmm. i'm saying <laughs> So it's like, you know, they always come with some fresh new shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm glad that you fuck with them. I hope you stay on their good side. I'm on their bad side currently. I'm on Sleaford Mods. Sleaford yeah, Mods? Yeah, I'm on Sleaford Mods bad side. But I, I think Man. I think at some point I'll get back on the good side. We'll see. But he has the best jacket collection. No oh, he has man. a good jacket collection? Yeah. The windbreakers are next level, man. Like I, his his tech game is. Uh, I I, I feel I feel like over there you could probably still get like some really dope windbreakers, whereas that that's that's not as. That's, oh yeah, that's their yeah, shit. That's that's not as that's not as hot as hot of like a trend over here. That's their shit. That's their but shit. but yeah, I mean, I, I guess like what I was trying to get to was. Uh, you know, the, with the growing influence that UK rap is having in the U.S. right now, do you feel like you know this is sort of a short? lived wave that's going to be gone in the next few no, years or it's going I to keep coming harder and harder i just think because the the internet is just making the world smaller in right general. exactly you know every shit everybody dresses the same now you know what i'm saying like you remember it was like regional like right. if you from here you wore reeboks if you live there you wore nights now everybody just look on instagram see what everybody wearing everybody look the fucking same now so it's don't really you know like identity nowhere it's just all going to be like one like matrix like we are you know like the same shit do the same shit type shit you know what i'm saying right. no exactly um <laughs> before i get into a few viewer questions i wanted to ask you just like a a question about personal taste here because uh, recently i and a lot of other people saw you uh for whatever reason just like you know uh uh shouting out sound bombing too which is obviously like an amazing like legendary compilation with M and Most Def and Talib and you know Pharaoh Monch and, and all that. Um all right, a rugged yes, man. All right, I, how, who all right, a rugged who man. can forget? Yeah. Who can yeah, one, of, one of the dirt one of the dirtiest. One of the dirtiest. He won't let you forget. <laughs> <laughs> Don't run it to him. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I, I guess I guess just to ask you pointedly, like, you know, uh, obviously I love the comp. A lot of people love the comp. We know what's great about it. But, you know, just for you personally saying that that project changed your life when you first heard it, like what about it did that for you? Did it give you a new perspective on rap music at the time? I mean, at the time, you got to think what was going on in the hip hop, right. you know, so and I didn't really know, like, you know, what I'm saying like. Like I, I, you know, I love rap. I love rap. I was Nas is my favorite rapper. Sure. So, but that's still compared to that is commercial. Hmm. You feel what I'm saying? I didn't know it got. You get what I'm saying? I still because at the time Nas wasn't. It still felt like kind of underground. You know what I'm saying? Because he wasn't all. He wasn't the popular, most popular. He wasn't. You know, 
when you said you was a Nas fan, you was kind of like, um, there's Tupac, Biggie, Jay-Z, you know what I'm saying? Like you was kind of, you know, you was a small, you know, you was a small little crew of that, you know what I'm saying? So it was still like, yeah. And once we seen some shots out Skywalker in the chat. <laughs> oh, Skywalker's in the chat? <laughs> yeah. I nice, nice. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, about both. So when I first heard it, yeah, just it made me be like, oh shit, the underground niggas is better than the mainstream niggas. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? That's what I feel like. I realized that. Like I was like, that's when I came to the realization. Like the best rappers aren't the ones we see on MTV and the ones that got all the money. That's that's it. That's not true. Like it's not true. That's not. So then it made me just dig deeper into shit like that. Yeah. You know. No, I mean, I I had a similar I think awakening around probably a little bit later because obviously like I'm, I'm five years younger, but just like getting into punk music in general, just kind of like opened up the idea that like, Oh, there's like underground versions of every popular form of music. That's like kind of better than whatever you're just kind of hearing on the radio. Yeah, exactly. And then, then when, like I started just doing my homework and just started like going back and listening to like company flow. And like, then when I heard cannibal Ox, it was a rap. Hmm. It was like, Cannibal Ox, once I heard Cannibal Ox, it was a rap. It was like, all right. Because to me, I thought like, I don't know. Like I say, I thought like Nas and Wu-Tang was underground. Mm. But that was really mainstream rap. You get what I'm saying? I, it just wasn't me listening to fucking, you know, the West Coast rap or what was popular. It wasn't a jiggy. So I thought I was still being cool listening to some underground shit. But then when I first was like, oh, it get <clears throat> under, under the ground. Like it's some real, you know, shit that's better than what's up there type shit, you know? Right. No. And, and look, I mean, there was like a long period of time where like listening to I mean, obviously that comp is great, but like there was a very long period of time where if you listen to that kind of shit, or at least this was like my experience, if you listen to that kind of shit, you were a backpacker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you were. You know, it was like it was, it was just mean, like a yeah. weird thing to listen to, you know, not not you a cool was. thing you to listen like, to. You smell like Mac Champa and fucking <laughs> patchouli oil and you wore them Eminem hats and them dumbass army jackets and shit. Like, yeah, that was that. I was one of those guys. Went to open mics and shit. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we all have our phases. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And, you know, while not like necessarily a 100% a backpack rap thing at the time, you know, uh, uh, along that same timeline, you had a guy like MF Doom who for as popular as he is now and, you know, as much of a legend as he is now, like throughout much of the 2000s, he was just like such a weird anomaly. And I don't think like really started popping off with like a, a, a at least mostly a white audience until like the Adult Swim embrace. Like when mm -hmm. Adult Swim started like, you know, putting out the Danger Doom thing and the Danger yeah, Mouse yeah, crossover yeah, exactly. happened. Like that was where it was almost like in terms of a crowd, you know, getting in touch with him like an aha moment. Mm hmm. Doom, I didn't, um, I remember first hearing Doom and I was like, man, why it sound like that? You know what I mean? Like it just sounded so cheap. Like it was like, you know, for it, like I didn't, I wasn't on the low right. shit at the Well, no, time. nobody and was. was. Like, like well, in, 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 every, in everyone's defense, <laughs> nobody was. I was like, why does it sound like right. that? So I couldn't, so I couldn't really, um, so I couldn't really, um, really, really get into it like that. I couldn't really figure it out. You know what I'm saying? So it took, to, I guess, like Mad Village. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I think that's when um, I think that's when I really like, oh, shit. Mm -hmm. You know, but I think I was just into the production still at that time. I don't think the actual songwriting caught me until like, like I went to jail and the shit used to be stuck in my head. Mm -hmm. And I would say lines from it and shit like, oh, shit. You know what I'm saying? I started getting what he mean. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like even from when he's like bust this like a cold milk off the toilet. I didn't know what he was talking about, but niggas in jail really be keeping cold milks in the toilet. You get what I'm saying? <laughs> but I didn't know what he was talking about at that time. You know what I'm saying? Wow. No, I mean, I'd like going back to just talking about the roughness of the production, like, you know, having a project like maybe Operation Doomsday be your first introduction could be could be could be kind of rough. But like Danger Doom was like a really professional sounding record, though. And I imagine like going back from there would probably be easier for a lot of people. Yeah, I was that wouldn't say that was my favorite. Story. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's not my favorite in retrospect either. No, it I mean, was Connor, it, it, you know, but. If you was into, um, you know, Aqua Teen Hunger Force and shit and all that shit, it was a cool, it was Yeah, cool. all, the, all the cartoon clips kind of get annoying after a while. But like... I think after a while, Doom, like, it, to me, man, when I listen to Doom, man, he's like, he's telling the story he was always going to do. And he always mm -hmm. told us he was, 
he always the villain. He gonna take the bag and run, man. Mm. You feel what I'm saying? So that's what he was always about. Mm. Doom get the cash and, and make a dash. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I, I already know what's up with Doom sometimes. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, try to throw a few uh, viewer questions at you before we let you go. Uh, I guess we have maybe a thought experiment here. <laughs> Street Wizard 99 wants to know if your 20 year old self had heard Atrocity Exhibition, what would you have thought of it? 20. Yeah. Um, I, wouldn't, I don't know. I wouldn't have been listening to that right. shit. I mean, I don't know. I probably wouldn't have liked it. Mm. I probably wouldn't have liked it at 20 years old. I probably wanted to hear some um, ass and titties and some something going to be shaking. You know what I'm saying? Something in the club. You know what I'm saying? My 20, my 20 I don't know. I think what year. Man, time goes by so fast. It does. <laughs> it really does. So I was, oh, I was 20 in 2001. Oh, I was like listening to like rock music and shit. <laughs> but I was listening to new metal and shit. I don't know. I mean, there's definitely like, I mean, obviously with the post-punk shit, there's some kind of noisy, weird fucking ass rock shit on that record though. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I say a trashy exhibition was the only album that I really had complete hands-on with mm. in that sense. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Where I was like, you know, uh, you know, I mean, JUS engineered it pretty much, you know what I'm saying, in my basement. And then, you know, I picked every, you know, I just feel like I just had the most hands-on with that. And I had the most, cause that was the first time working with a budget. You know what I'm saying? That was my, that was my time to shine. You know what I'm mm. saying? So I, I'm, I'm proud of that album. You know what I'm saying? And I'm proud of the way it was aging. Mm. For one thing, you know, because I remember first time playing it for people that, you know, you got to remember I made old before that. I'm coming off old, right. so they like, you know, you know, they like, oh, I don't see, it. I don't know about this one. <laughs> I don't know about this one. You know what I'm saying? And you know, here we are. No, I, I, I mean, obviously, you saw the fucking video I did about the album being, you know, so many years old at this point. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and yeah, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, it feels really weird to think about it being as old as it is at this point. But, um, I, I think the fact that it still doesn't sound like anything else is a testament to it. You know what I mean? Because, you know, that album sounded so unique when it came out and the further out we get from it, the, you know, the more of a unique, I guess, moment it feels like, because it sort of seems like. Uh, something that I'm, I'm still not hearing from anybody right now. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's still just such a, uh, I guess, a, a, an idiosyncratic thing. I mean, it's a lot of credit to Paul White too. Mm. You know, I have to give him a lot of credit. Cause I mean, you know, you can get, you know, like I get beats from everybody and stuff like that. And a lot of stuff don't really inspire me to do stuff. It's just like, but he would just send me stuff or I'll have stuff like when Paul would send me beats, he'll send me like 20, 30 beats. Mm. And he'd been doing this since like 2010. So I have over a thousand beats from Paul White. Whenever I get bored, I just go back into the, and just find like half of those beats on the Trusty Exhibition, like five-year-old beats that I've heard forever. So I had a lot of time to sit with them and was able to write with them, you know? Mm. Is, <laughs> when you're talking about like um, that lack of inspiration in a way, is that what has been kind of driving your own interest in getting more into production that you were kind of referencing earlier? No, I always made beats. Yeah. I just, um... You know, I just always felt like people made better beats. Mm -hmm. So why would I fucking rap on my <laughs> shit? If I know somebody, if I know Alchemist, why would I? But then Alchemist came to my career one day and I, I played him some of my beats. He's like, oh shit, your shit fire. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But I'm going to tell you like this. My first beat machine I ever had was an SP-303. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I learned that and I hated on it because I was like, fuck, I need an MPC. Mm -hmm. You know, this is when the MPC 2000s was like, felt like a million dollars to me at the time. I couldn't afford that mm. shit. So I was like, man, the fucking SP-303 sucks. You get what I'm saying? And then now we got Mad Villain and Donuts from it. And you can't even fucking buy an SP-303 to save your right, life. Exactly. Right, exactly. You know what I'm saying? Right, exactly. Now, now, now that you know that that's where those albums came from, you can't really hate on the SP. Mm -hmm. And and and, yeah, and now so, Mad Lib's making beats on the iPad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so then I went, you know, I got an MPC. I learned the MPC. And, you know, I just always, I never not had a beat machine. Mm. You feel what I'm saying? And I feel like that's why me learning how to make beats is how I know how to pick a good beat. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because I know what went into it. I know what, you know what I'm saying? So I know when it's just like, oh, you just some bullshit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Even though sometimes, you know, making beats, the thing is about making beats is really about your ear, you know, because you can do the simplest shit and it can be the most fiery shit in the world. You can make a beat with a 
hundred tracks and it's fucking terrible. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's just really about your ear and your swag and shit. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, I'm just not getting to the point where I'm just, I feel like I've rapped over a lot of motherfucker beats and then when they make songs with other motherfuckers, you know, you can tell it's they shit. But when I feel like they do songs with me, it is a Danny Brown song. Like, so I feel like I kind of been producing this whole time, mm. just using other motherfuckers. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's all. Yeah, I mean, you can really <laughs> kind of tell when somebody is like making a whole record of just spitting on whatever beat somebody handed them. And it just sort of has like, you know, I, I don't know if, I mean, you've probably noticed this, but it sort of seems like whenever I'm listening to some new shit, especially when it's some younger shit, it's like everybody's got the same fucking MIDI piano in their shit now. And <laughs> like, it's, it's, re- it's really getting on my fucking nerves and not that I mind a MIDI piano in general, but it just sort of feels like everyone's on the same fucking MIDI piano. And, you know, look, I, I, cause they are, cause they literally are, <laughs> cause they cause are. They are. <laughs> and look, like I could get, I could get behind sticking to something that is as tried and true as like, you know, the perks from like the 808, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. part of me enjoys the fact that that's kind of back in play and that producers are kind of doing some cool things and advancing with that. But to hear the same goddamn MIDI piano over and over and over on everybody's fucking song, whether it's like a Roddy Rich song or a Rod Wave song or a Polo G song mm-hmm. or, and you know, not to, you know, rag on those artists because I all think they respectively make good tracks, but it just sort of feels like, again, it's that same piano plug in over and over and over. And yeah. I don't know, like it is. It, no, I know exactly what yeah. you're talking about. I hear a hundred. I got <laughs> The whole California sounds like the MIDI keyboard, like right now. So, I mean, it is what it is, man. I, I think it's even just cool now, like what I was talking about, where I had the SP303, which was still like a $300 beat machine, I sure. think. And I was like, oh, I need $2,000. Now these kids could just get a laptop and become producers tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? So I do think that's great because in our general, you know what I'm saying, back in the day, if you ain't had no money, you couldn't be a rapper. You needed studio time. You needed to buy equipment. If you wanted to make beats, you need to do that now. You know, it's, it's like, if you good at it, we gonna, we gonna know you get a chance. Mm-hmm. You get a, everybody get a chance now. Where before, if you ain't had a funds, you just didn't have a chance. You know? mm-hmm. No, I mean, I, I agree. There is kind of like an equalization, I guess, as a result of that. It sort of, you know, lets anybody in the door who actually wants to try. Um, and I, I guess I guess the question is like, do you, do you feel like do you feel like the results are kind of like moving in a positive direction as a result of that, though? Not not to not to embrace like some kind of feeling of elitism or like, you know, so people shouldn't be allowed to. Of course, I don't feel that way, but it sort of feels like and maybe this is sort of like the algorithm and social media platforms doing this. But it feels like all that's happened as a result of that is like a race to the bottom. Like whoever can make the shortest track that'll appeal to TikTok the fastest with like some outlandish like kind of social media bullshit attached to it. Like that's that's going to be what floats while everything else is kind of just like hanging in some kind of weird fucking purgatory. Yeah, I mean, like I say, man, I don't, I don't complain because I don't want to like, you know, because like I say, I, 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 you know, at the end of the day, I kind of get jealous. I wish I had some of the shit these kids got now. You know what I'm saying? So. You know, I just hope they appreciate it and understand because at the end of the day, like, you don't want to, um, like, 10 years later and, you know, hear a song you made when you was 19 and be like, oh, my fucking God. You know, because there's no artist development, really. And when I was 19 making songs in the basement, you know, I'm just, we're hearing kids learning. You know, they're learning as they're having a career. Mm. You get what I'm saying? Sure. It's not so... I would hate to have, you know, if you guys heard some of my songs, like before I got good, like, you know, like, I think that would be the one thing that would, I don't know, I, I might, wouldn't know, I just don't want that out there, you know? <clears throat> no, I hear that. But I, you know, I, I guess like, I'll, I'll just say just from my own perspective, I just feel like considering how popular like weirdness is now and you're like the weird fucking OG in a lot of ways. Like it it just doesn't make sense to me that like, why aren't there like 10 songs, like 10 Danny Brown songs popping off on TikTok right now? Why is like shit on all (laughs) shit all on your mixtape? Like not what what, what, you can't be. Listen, 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 people, people do all sorts of weird fucking, you know, jokes to whatever kind of sound. I'm just saying shit all on your mixtape is like is because, like a ripe fucking sound for tiktok 
because you go, you know these record labels pay for the fucking yeah. TikTok and fluid. No, that's true. You know, we just seen man, they just sound called kicks and all that man. Yeah. You know what's going on. It's it's, it's all it's all a game. <laughs> your shit get you'll get shadow banned, yeah. man, if your shit got to cracking organically now, man. Yeah. So it is what it is. Okay. I you know, like honestly, like get bruiser wolf on TikTok. Just think about it. Just think about it. Consider it. I love TikTok, man. My shit just turned to conspiracy theories and motherfuckers telling me to buy CMOS now. So I don't know what's going on with my algorithm, man. Yeah. I don't even see no fucking dances and shit. No. There's like, you know, as a result of like the Astroworld stuff, there's a big satanic panic happening now. Everybody thinks like, you know, oh, yeah. all concerts are just energy harvesting rituals. Yeah. Cause Robert Johnson, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Look, thank you, man, for coming on and having a conversation. Thank you and- for having me. Uh, listen, we're 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 look we're looking forward to Quaranta. 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 Yeah, it's very very elegant. It's, it's, it's very, very elegant. it's very elegant. It's very elegant. <laughs> it's it's elegant. The music that it's saying. elegant like a fucking Adele record. You know, you you guys have the age thing going back and forth. Yeah, you know, definitely, definitely. exactly. I love Adele. She's fire. Yeah. So shout out to Adele. shout out to Adele. <laughs> All right, man. Have a good one, everybody, man. All right, have a good one, man.